All right, welcome everybody. I'm Erin Velarde, the founder of Vote Run Lead. And with us, we have Mary Pat Hector as part of our Amplifying Women Leaders of Georgia that we are doing all day today. Um, we kicked off last night at five o'clock with Kimberly Jones, which was uh, a joyful and passionate 45 minute conversation. So I encourage you to go um, watch that. And I think you are in for the same um, kind of joy and love and leadership and uh, and fight with Mary Pat Hector, who um, we have with us today. So welcome, Mary Pat. Thank you so much for having me, Erin. Yes, you are a, a remarkable young woman at 21 years old. You had have already definitely lived nine lives. Um, your activism started really early as I was learning more about you, um, sort of preteen, you know, um, and, and you're really a model, I think, to other teen activists. I'd love to hear a little bit about how um, how you came to be and what that's been like to be a, a really recognized national leader. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, recently a 22 year old, I do, uh, all right. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, but I'll probably try to stay as 22 as long as possible. Um, but for me, how I really got involved in activism and politics was just growing up seeing, um, you know, gun violence and police brutality and other issues plaguing my community and realizing that I was tired of waiting for uh, another Dr. Martin Luther King or another Sojourner Truth or someone to come and save me uh, or my community. And, you know, oftentimes you, you hear the words, you have to be um, the change that you want to see. But we tell young people to wait and we tell them, you know, to leave it up to adults. Uh, but it got to a point to where I said, I'm tired of waiting for an adult. Uh, where are they? And so I took it upon myself to educate myself on different uh, organizations and different ways in which I could um, change the world at such a young age. Um, and that's how I got involved with the National Action Network, the Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda and other organizations. Um, and then I realized just protesting and bringing awareness to issues is important but it's also important to think about the politics end of it, yeah. right? So yes, bringing awareness to these issues are important, but the only way you really change a circumstance is through public policy. Um, and so now it's my life's mission to not only uh, bring awareness to issues through activism uh, and mobilizing, but also you know, getting young people to understand the importance of using their voice and also run for office. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about your run in a minute, but I, I want to, you know, we we want to make sure, especially in our conversation with with women in Georgia, that you know we saw we are watching what's happening. The nation is watching what's happening, um, and also the elections, right? That when we knew the Georgia elections were going to be a bit of a mess, I don't think we understood, you know, how rough it was going to be um, two Tuesdays ago, and really um, the visible disparities we could see in black communities and in and, uh, white wealthy neighborhoods where it was an easy breeze to walk in. Um, I'd love, you know, I think sometimes that can be disheartening, especially for young people, right, who are always told to sort of get out the vote. Um, what is your reaction? And, and what do you say to young people who are like, What's I don't why do I vote? You know, why does it matter? Look what's happening. Or I've been voting and it's not enough. You know, I think that's really a conversation I'm hearing and I'd I'd love to hear some of your wisdom on that. Absolutely. So one I hear all the time about the distrust that young people have for the government. And uh while I still participate in uh, the voting process and exercise my political agency, the concerns in which these young people share are right understandable. Um, but instead of thinking about it that way, uh, we have to, to think about the fact that you use your vote to put people in places of power uh, to change that narrative. You know, I, I got tired myself of even seeing, and, and, and I've been talking about this specifically at many of the actions in which I've been attending, of us talking about reform uh, yeah. But we're talking about reform to elected officials that have been in office for like 40 years. Yeah. Um, so how are we going to get change if we do that? So showing young people, listen, we need to look at people who are running for office that are the new guard, I guess. Right. Instead of just the old the old regular people that we've been voting for for 30 and 40 years yeah. uh, who haven't done anything. So showing them that way, you know, and then also 
I will say that while we have been protesting, I was so proud of the young people that have been protesting, but did wait in those eight and nine hour long lines at the polls in Georgia and made history. Um, that's what it's all about. And I hope, and I know that we're gonna see that same energy in November. We have I think to- so. Yes. I think so. I think, um, you know, one of the things that's making me really hopeful for the future is the pace of change that young people want, expect, right? that the sort of, um, yeah, we want these reforms now, you know, we, we're gonna vote you out a few days later. Um, you know, the just sort of global young people on TikTok, right, and their, their recent activism. And so I, I'm really hopeful for that. And I am hopeful to see a new wave of young people running for office. And I know you're hosting the, a train-in on Saturday. I wanna hear a little bit more about, you know, why it's also outdoors. Like I want to hear a little bit about this organizing tactic. It's brilliance. Um, and so tell us a little bit about Saturday and what you plan on doing. Yeah. So um, after holding a lot of actions in the city of Atlanta specifically, one of the things that we wanted to do was ensure that we are organizing with young people, right? So not just protesting, but organizing, thinking and developing strategies collectively to get young people to understand things that they could do in places in which they fit into this movement. Uh, and so we did this outside for social distancing purposes, yeah. uh, of course, uh, to keep people safe, uh, but also to give them a new experience, right? We didn't wanna have them in you know, a, a nice building where, you know, we tell them to enter with their respectability politics. We wanted them to be their authentic selves. And nice. we felt uh, being at a park directly across from the Atlanta Student Movement Boulevard, which is where the civil rights movement in Atlanta basically spearheaded from, uh, to allow them that, that chance and that opportunity and that space. So this upcoming Saturday, we really wanted to put the focus on young people running no. This between the ages of 18 and 30, but they told me, Mary, 35. I said, okay, I guess we'll go ahead and say 35. Um, it's still young, but I'm 22. Um, so between the ages of 18 and 35 to get them to run for office, to provide them with resources for them to be able to do so. Um, we spoke to Mrs. Ron and others and just working and partnering with different organizations like Run, Vote, Lead um, to show that, you know, just to send them and yep. to provide them with resources so that they can be successful in many of their um, campaigns. And so yeah. I'm very excited and we're, we're hoping that we get between 25 and 50 young people in the state of yes. Georgia to run for office. Great, we're, we're psyched um, and we're so psyched that Rhonda can be a part of it and we will be there to help with the follow up and we've got all sorts of links and stuff to send you for like, okay, well, you know, fundraising is not my, my stick, right? Okay, great, we'll, we'll help you all make sure that you get all those resources for the, the folks that are attending. Um, and you yourself have run for office. Um, I wanna hear a little bit about that race um, and you know, how you've remained resilient. It was a tight loss and I'd love for you to share with people because I do think, I think especially for young people, it feels like a risk, you know, that like, well, if I'm gonna be out there, it's gonna get covered and if I lose, you know, um, and and how, you know, how you sort of um, took that with stride. Well, I'll tell you, Erin, after running for office myself, I gained so much respect for every person who's ever run for office ever. Uh, despite how I might feel about them politically. And one of the things yeah. that I learned was just that, right? Just respecting the people that put themselves out there to run. Uh, I was 19 years old. I was still a sophomore at Spelman College. And this started directly after the 2016 election results came in, where young people gathered and we asked ourselves, what are we gonna do next? And that was really the beginning of what we're seeing now when it comes to power shift and like young people running for office. And so I had an opportunity to, you know, through my work at NAN and other organizations, you know, be in positions where I was able to talk to President Barack Obama on criminal justice reform. I was able to mobilize um, nationally, you know, around issues like stop and frisk in New York City. Yeah. And so I, I guess I just decided to run for office in my community it was a newly developed city during that time. You know, they developed the um, new city of South Fulton and the new city of um, Stonecrest. Mm -hmm. And I ran for office. Um, my race was contested because of my age. People thought I was too young to run. I remained on the ballot and ended up losing by 22 votes. Um, but, you know, it's my goal moving forward that 
you know, I support young people who want to run for office and ensure that they win by those 22 votes we were talking about earlier, Aaron. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. Um, and, and you continue to do so. And then Saturday is a real testament to that. Um, I want to uh, shift the conversation a little bit around um, we had checked in briefly and really in this moment, right, in this moment of um, uh, reckoning and uprising and um, and power, I think, that we're seeing in our country. Um, we how do we continue to center women? How do we con continue to center? Center Black women. Um, when I called you yesterday, I heard the rally behind you. You're at the ra a rally for Breonna Taylor, um, and that's definitely a conversation we're having inside of Vote Run Lead. And I'd love to hear your insights as how you continue to do that as an activist, how you continue to do that also inside some of the organizations and entities that you're a part of. Really, Aaron, it's me finding my voice every single day. Um, and I had a conversation with a group of diverse, um, diversified women yesterday where I literally said, you know, it's important for us to keep black women at the center because oftentimes as a black woman, you know, intersectionality is hard. When I'm fighting for women's rights, you know, and I constantly have to choose, right? If it's women's rights or if it's uh, rights for African-Americans and if it's women's rights, it will benefit white women the most. Or if it's uh, black people's rights, it'll benefit black men the most. And I realized, um, you know, marching about a few weeks ago, that as we're saying Black Lives Matter, I'm literally only hearing the names George Floyd, Ahmed Omri, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin. And I, I, I asked, you know, people at the rallies, like other than Breonna Taylor, which was, was a recent case, which they're, they're not even saying her name, you know, do you know any women that were killed due to police violence? And literally the only two names that they could say were Breonna Taylor and Sandra Bland. Uh, but what about Atatiana Jefferson? What about Ayanna Jones? You know, what about women of color that were killed due to police violence? Mm -hmm. um, and so every day, and, and even not only just that, but also like at work or in the boardroom, um, when you look around and you look at women in positions of power and you often don't see women of color in those positions, how can we begin to during this conversation of, of activism, talking about women of color um, experiencing police violence, but also systemic oppression and what that looks like in boardrooms and organizations. And um, I believe that black women are finding their voice and they're saying, you know, what about me? Don't forget about me. Um, but it's important for allies, you know, black men, white women and others to remember that as well. Right. right. Um, Thank you for sharing that and, and thank you for that inspiration. Um, the, you know, I think one of the sort of macro conversations we're having about that is um, the vice presidential pick, right? Um, and the, you know, we've got uh, ads running right now, right, down to a sort of top five contenders, four of whom are black women um, and Elizabeth Warren. Um, and the, to, to sort of see that conversation, I think, happen on a national level is so powerful. Um, but it's also like a long time coming, right? It's a, it's, it, it feels, um, it also feels a little uh, just representative, right? It also can sometimes feel like, so how do we get, how do we get that conversation to be both really meeting in the middle, right? Really this grass tops conversation and this activist conversation. And I want to hear your uh, vice presidential pick. So sort of a, a two part question there. Wow, I'm gonna go with the first vice presidential uh, pick, and it would have to, of course, be Stacey Abrams. I, I really, even though I'm selfish with her, like I really want her to be the governor of Georgia because Georgia needs Stacey. Yeah, I, I feel also, the, same the, way. World, <laughs> the world could benefit from just her in general and her awesomeness. And she is my Spelman sister, and so I literally love Stacey Abrams, yeah. and I've watched her in Georgia four years. And you were both on the Essence uh, Woke 100 Women, the two of yes. you. That was very yes. cool. Yes. yes. I, I love Stacey Abrams. Um, but when you think about this conversation, and I appreciate, um, you know, people considering Black women for these positions, because like you said, it's a long time coming. Um, and these are qualified Black women. Um, yes. And it also shows you that Black women can be qualified for these positions um, and they deserve them and they work hard. And the, the bench is so deep. It's like the, the bench is so deep that I think, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you know, just to, to add, I think to what you're saying, it is, it's like, didn't you know who they were before? 
you know, like there's a frustration there, I think, as well, because the bench is really deep. Um, and it bothers me, too, that it's VP candidates. You know, it's like any of those women would make yeah. remarkable presidential candidates. Okay, you keep going. Sorry. <laughs> These are my two the cents. Woman made an absolute amazing presidential candidate. Um, but I will say, like, I mean, like you said, it's a, a long time coming. And yes, we're talking about the intersectionality piece, but just stepping out, women in general um, deserve this. And uh, when you think about women not even being considered qualified enough to yeah. be a president or a vice president, let alone a black woman, uh, but I'm happy that there's resistance. I'm happy that um, candidates are seeing that this is a need. And yeah. it just happens to be during I, what I feel uh, as a resurgence of the civil rights movement. There's no better time than right now to see a black woman become the vice president and then soon uh, president of the United States of America. Well, I was reading about you in, uh, I think it was Glamour, and there was a, a question that said, you know, by 2024, I plan on being president of the United States. So I wonder if that is, uh, that's still on your agenda. Um, or maybe it's an AJC article. I can't remember where I saw it, but um, it was, I think you were, I think you were younger at the time. So I want to check it. I was much younger, and that was before I ran a political campaign. <laughs> Let me tell you, um, you know, I still have high hopes and dreams of uh, remaining in um, the political, you know, in, in politics. Um, but also, I plan on going to law school soon. So maybe that president of the United States may one day be Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what do you think will be different? I mean, you're going to be training, you know, um, dozens of young people on Saturday, you know, what, what will be different as we see more young people, especially more young women step into political power to run for office and, and win? What will change? I feel a lot will change because I'm hoping that with this power shift, um, our country will begin to be represented by people that it looks like, um, you know, it's not just older, it's not just white and it's not just male. Um, but it, it represents the country as a whole. And there's that new burst of energy that young people have that we're seeing right now in this moment um, where they're ready for change now. And I believe if there are more young people ready for change now, so much can happen within our country. We've seen that historically when you think about the civil rights movement or even just young people in general when they are just fed up and tired, right? Looking at a part the eye, looking at just different movements throughout the world where young people said enough was enough. And again, we can't continue to just talk about this um, on a, 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 a looking through, you know, protesting and activism, but also policy and where the change really happens. And I just, we just need more young people in positions of power in order to change um, yeah. what we're seeing right now in our country when it comes to reform and other systemic forms of oppression that policy could help in or eradicate. Right, right. And I mean, speaking of policy this week, we saw in the state a house and the governor did sign it on the uh, the hate crime bill passed in the Georgia legislature. Um, and that's progress, right? But um, I'd love to hear what you what do you want people in Georgia specifically and some of the women leaders that are watching? Um, you know, what do you want them to do? What's the action between now and November? What's the short term? And then what do you what do you say to folks for their sort of long term leadership development? I mean, hearing you say you got yourself educated, you you know just sort of went out and did it. Um, so I, I'm sorry I'm giving you all these sort of multi part questions, but I just, <laughs> um, yeah, I'd lo I'd love to hear about that. Like what right now in the next couple of months, you know, what is what is the priorities for you that you want people to really sink their teeth into, and then let's talk long term after that. Um, as women, uh, oftentimes when we voice our opinions, we're seen as angry, um, but be angry, right? We have so much to be angry about, specifically right here in Georgia. When you think about how our elections are taking place, when you think about, you know, recent cases of police bruta um, brutality and misconduct, right. it's important for us to begin to hold our elected officials accountable. Um, and if some of those elected officials are women, you know, we have to talk to our sisters and say, right. listen, we need right. more from you. Um, right. and it's time for you to be here right now um, and do what we, we put you in office to do. Um, and so I feel like as women, we have or to- Or I have 50 people who are run against you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, That's right. you're, you're about to lose your job. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. So it's, it's important for us to be unapologetically us 
despite you know the controlling images that are out there about women or women of color and just sit in that and 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 be angry be upset and hold these people accountable because for too long we've allowed them to get away with just anything. Um, and now it's just not the time. And I think you had another question for me. On just the long term, you know, as and and I think that's right for the short term, right? Is to sort of stay resilient, you know, stay mad, um, stay vigilant about what what we're after. Um, and and long term, what are, what are your um, let's make it positive, you know, long term, I think what are what are the things that you are hopeful about long term? Um, I am hopeful about police reform. Yeah, I am hopeful about more women um, running for office and winning. I'm hopeful about the next vice president of the United States looking like me so that my daughter will say I can be president and it actually be um, something that she can attain. Yeah. Uh, and I'm hopeful about change. Uh, I've been very proud of just the um, allyship and the love and support that we've all had for each other um, these past months, whether it was COVID-19 or what we're witnessing right now on the grounds when it comes to, you know, the protests and things happening. Um, and in that, in those crowds, you've seen people standing um, with each other that look like our country. And yeah. I'm just hopeful for that change. And I'm just hopeful um, that we'll get through this together. Mary Pat, one last question for you and, and how you are, um, you are a joy. I, I thought you were going to be a joy and you are a joy. So thank you for sharing that with me and with our community. Um, how are you staying resilient? How are you staying so beautiful and, and smiling? And um, share with us what, what you do to sort of take care of yourself as you continue to lead. That is a question that I'm trying to ask myself yeah. every day. Um, because it's, I mean, you know, this work gets hard, um, and it's just not pretty all the time. Yeah. Uh, but I am, you know, ensuring that I'm holding myself accountable, um, to also take space for me. So, you know, understanding that I can't go out into the yeah. streets every day to protest or rally in some time and I still have a job. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have to do my work too, but also just taking some me time, um, and, you know, every day uh, with my job from risefree.org, we have what we call every other day, we have something called fun, where literally we just talk to each other for about 32 minutes to an hour about, you know, random things or we'll ask random questions and we nice. just are able to just be people again, right? Or just yeah. keep our minds yeah. off of things. Uh, but also Insecure um, helped, but now it's off of uh, HBO. <laughs> HBO <laughs> But every Sunday, just me wishing or hoping that Insecure, the episode would be great. That's helped me get through. So now I'm, I'm rewatching it all over again this season. Nice. I love it. I love it. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I hope you feel the love and energy and can take some of that forward um, from our community and from me. Um, and I'm so grateful to be connected. VRL will be back in Georgia very soon. So we will definitely be there to support your leadership and the folks that you're training right now. And we'll have some good news in the next couple of weeks about Georgia. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for doing this today. I know how busy you are. Thank you. We'll see you soon in person, hopefully. Yes. <laughs>